Recorded live at Tox and Tasting Studios, it's the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. Let's go. From the Tox and Tasting Studios, this is the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. I'm Bullhagen. This is Vicar. We got uh, a Bullhagen and Vicar one and a half pastor episode again today. <laughs> okay. that's, originally that's what they're called, one and a half pastor. Oh, I, that's my first time hearing it. I mean, the indicating I have not yet gone back and listened to the podcasts. <laughs> so we're learning about all of this together. But I got lots of interesting things, hopefully, to talk about. We've got the text. Uh, we've got beverages. Now, you brought a beverage that uh, you don't like. Could you yes. explain? Because we were starting to have a conversation, and then you didn't understand, and so we decided, let's save this for the podcast. Right, right. So I, I will just tell my part of the story, and you could tell me the moral of the story, I guess, because I didn't get it. All right, I have a beverage I don't like, and what it is, and this is no blow against the manufacturer or the product, really, it's just me, it's a Bigelow brand, Eggnoggin, an exceptional winter tea, and that what it is is an eggnog-flavored tea, and the tea leaves are a blend of black and green teas, and they've been flavored like eggnog. So years ago, handful of years ago, I got a hold of some of this, and it was so new and interesting and novel, I thought, that is so good. And I freaked out, and I went and I ordered six boxes of this tea. And just about the time that all six of those boxes showed up at my doorstep was just about the same day I realized, wait a minute, I don't really like this. It was novel and new, and it was, you know, interesting, and now I own six boxes of it and have concluded... I don't really like it. It was just new and novel. And so uh, now, years later, I, I feel compelled to try to grind through the last of my uh, uh, backlog of this flavored tea and use it up because I hate throwing away stuff that technically is still good. Anyway, so I've got a giant uh, container, a giant cup of this eggnog flavored tea, and I don't like it. All right. So, and I said, oh, that'll be a good way to talk about contemporary worship. And- ah, Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now I can see it. Now, now you're seeing it, right? Because yeah. what what draws uh, churches to do contemporary? Because it's it's novel and new and like a breath of fresh air. Right. And then at some point they they realize, in some cases at least, maybe they don't. Right. Uh, because sometimes the answer is, well, uh, we need to get even more novel now when that wears off. Right. right. We're always searching for the next new thing. Right? Yes. But at some point they realize. This isn't very good. Yeah. <laughs> it's like eating a birthday cake frosting, right? Like a little of it, it seems really good. And then as you take like the 10th bite of frosting in a row, that's my analogy for it. Right. Anyway. It's not good. So so that was my analogy. So that, that's why I wanted to talk about talk, you to mention that because to mm. me, that that's a kind of what happens, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Yeah, I and then it, 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 see the thing is, how do you know that the liturgy isn't that way? Because it's it actually lasts. It lasts, and I'll, I think I mean there's probably contemporary a lot of by nature, by mm-hmm. even the word means it's not going to last. Yep. That means this it, is here for today. Yep, goes out of style. Yep, absolutely. Right. You and know, I, I always thought that that's a reason why young people have wandered away from church and the to the quantities that they have is because there was this attempt to appeal to them with contemporary worship, and it's not very authentic, it's not native, so to speak, to the people that are doing it, and young people detect that right away. Right. And the fact that that things are moving so fast yeah. that when a 50-year-old pastor, such as ourselves, right, people yep. our age, One try to, to say, oh, let's do something contemporary, mm-hmm. we have no idea. Right. Like, <laughs> right, outcomes are Def Leppard t-shirts or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Kind of like when, when I was in high school, you know, contemporary was... Uh, thought of by many, oh, let's sing Kumbaya in church. You right. Know? Yeah. And square dance or something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. So we're automatically outdated by trying to keep up with whatever the edge of trendy is. And we have no idea because we're middle aged. <laughs> and then so you, you're stuck with with eggnog tea. Yeah. Eggnog and you bought tea. into it. Yep. And you realize, uh oh, this actually isn't very it's good. It's not good. Nope. It's just novel, and novel wears off quick. Which brings us to the Reformation. Oh, okay. Transition. Yeah. Another transition you didn't see happening. No, I'm way behind right today. To me, that's how churches view the Reformation differently. Hmm. Can I explain? Yes, please. Okay. So, uh, there's 
And I, especially within the Lutheran church, especially different kinds of Lutherans. Hmm. Okay. So when we talk about the Reformation, we talk about Scripture. You know, the Reforming was salvation by grace alone, uh, through faith alone. Right. Right. As found in Scripture. In Scripture alone, right? And so Reformation always goes back to that for us. Yes, it does. Always goes back to that. Okay? Yeah. Uh, Other Lutherans and other denominations view Reformation is a revolution of change. A modernizing. Right. Jesus got everyone to view things a certain way, and we are always needing to reform. Mm. We're always, and it's kind of like an anti-the man type of a thing, where we're always seeking uh, to reform. And so, and and this is why, um, if on, for Reformation, if you go to a lot of ELCA churches, they'll use this opportunity to talk about trans rights, and they'll talk about right. all these things and these modern battles that they think that we're in, because uh, with the Reformation spirit that Luther oh. brought, we need to continue that Reformation spirit and reform everything. Right. So instead of seeing it as... Luther going back to the gospel, they saw it as progress, progressivism. Right. Yeah. Luther was the original, the OG. Uh, progressive. Progressive. Oh, goodness. Yeah. They read it backwards. And, and, and by the way, Luther actually had this tr- trouble in his day as well. Mm. Mm-hmm. When uh, people were using his name in the Reformation movement to be violent and do all sorts of things, right. that Luther said, eh. Right. The peasant revolt, for example. The Right. People thought they would be with him, and he was absolutely not with that movement. Right. Because they said, oh, this is the Reformation spirit. We're latching on to this. And right. Luther was actually, it's about going to the Word. Yeah. And so uh, so if your church says, we need to grasp on to Luther's Reformation spirit and the Reformation of, of Jesus and, uh, and, uh, yeah. and move forward and address all these these things that the the Bible doesn't actually say and something that Jesus would never say. Right. Then maybe you should think uh, we need a real reformation and right. go back to Scripture. Go back to the Scripture and to orthodoxy. So, so listener, uh, that's something for you to watch out for. Yeah. A little little tip by the Clerical Heirs podcast. So uh, since we are doing Reformation Sunday, uh, why don't you go ahead and read the Gospel reading, Vicar? Okay, got it. Holy Gospel according to St. John chapter 8. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly I say to you, Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. All right, so a few things here. Uh, I'm going to say there's three main things as I think about this text that I think will clear things up for the listener. Okay. And that will, will help preach a sermon. And that is, first of all, understanding what it means to abide in the Word. Okay. If you abide in my Word. Okay. Um, that is, to abide in Word means um, it's, anti- it's different than the way we actually think of freedom. Modern day. Okay. Because when you abide in the Word, you're saying that there is a truth and there is a freedom greater than the freedom that you have in yourself. Okay. So, for example, uh, modern-day freedom will say this. You're free to be whatever you want to be. Right. To to do whatever you want to do, to live as you see fit for yourself. Right? Right. But when, when you abide in the Word, you're saying, okay, but... I also know that there is a word and a will greater than my own. Hmm. And you're saying to abide in the word means that this word is truth. And if there's a there's disc there's if we're not congruent with my life 
and the word, how I think and the word, the word doesn't change. Right. I change. Okay. So you're saying that there is a will, an idea, a truth that is that might be different than your own person, but if there is that if there's not congruent, then to abide in the word says, Okay, I know it's not the word. It must be me. It must be me. Yep. Now the world would say that is not freedom. Right. You You're a sl- enslaved to the word. You're right. not free. Right. So, so to to help understand this text and to preach it, um, I would say that that's one aspect you have to grasp onto. What does it mean to abide in the Word? To live in the Word, right? And that part of that is to to realize that the words and its will, even though it might be different than yours, your own will, your own ideas, what you want to do, how you want to live, all those things. Hmm. Uh, Especially when it comes to the gospel, which is the highlight, that's what truly makes you free. Right. But to abide in the word encompasses all of these things. Right. It, you know, where nowadays people would say, well, doesn't that make you a slave? That's what they would say, for sure. But but it seems like the alternative to abiding in the word, which is the truth, is to embrace a lie. And that's its own type of uh, slavery, holding on to a lie. Right. Right, and, and I think too. So, and and he equates slavery with sin. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Right now, now there there's another aspect because uh, that's not how the modern person thinks of slavery. No, not at all. Right, I'm free to sin. Right, and I'm free to live as I see fit. Uh, where the Bible says, no, actually, that's slavery right you know that that is the the one thing that i i see in in modern day aspects of how everyone thinks they're free but they're not right and they think of it it's amazing it's they, they think of it the other way around right that oh i have free will i can make free choices and they fail to note that their choices are bound up in their uh, inherent desire to sin Right, that corruption has enslaved them. Uh, so, for example, uh, when you think, "Oh, the internet makes us free because we have freed all these ideas, right, and all those things," but actually, what it means is it it it, uh, it finds other avenues for others to actually control your thought, right? <laughs> control what you do, right. Control your spending habits, uh, you know, yep. uh, listening to things, uh, you know, um, the flow of information, the things they do not even present to you. Yeah, because you're not always. You know, you're subject in that space uh, to to see what Google wants you to see and not see what Google doesn't want you right. to see. So th- this, if if I could have one moment, uh, yesterday uh, it came out that the PayPal organization that does online monetary transactions for individuals, that they will fine you $2,500 if they decide that you are spreading misinformation. And when that came out a few weeks ago and was discovered in their terms or updated terms and agreement, it, it got some noise on the internet and they retracted that and said, oh, that was, that was an error. That wasn't, we didn't mean to do that, which is BS. How do you accidentally update your terms and conditions? Well, as of yesterday, they inserted that language back in. They will fine you $2,500 if they think you have spread misinformation. So an account that I have had for 20 years, I opened my PayPal account in 2002 I closed it last night. I ended my relationship with PayPal because I don't want them deciding when I have spread misinformation and then finding me and keeping money. So there you go. And I guess you were free to make that choice. I was free apparently <laughs> to make that choice. <laughs> so so the other the other aspect then is that we've talked about what does it mean to buy in the word? What does it mean to be free? And and Jesus well, why don't we let Jesus find it? Free from sin, set free by the Son. And and that freedom uh, this comes from John, right? Yeah. And later, Jesus, in that same book, in chapter 20, would talk about how that freedom looks like when he says, I'm sending to the to the disciples, uh, breathe on them the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. forgiven. So he's saying, just like he says later in John, I am the one that 
will give freedom through the forgiveness of sins. I will, if the son sets you free, you were free. And so then he sends his disciples out to say, guess what? You get to, you get to bring this freedom uh, to all nations. Right. And it also has the adoption language that St. Paul used so effectively because the son remains forever. So when you've been adopted as a child of God, you are able to remain in the kingdom of God, the house of God forever because you're not just a slave that has to be let go after a while, but you have been adopted as a son and you stay forever. And it's interesting how they say, well, we're, our, we have Father Abraham. We've never been slaves yeah. to anyone. They're defined by having been enslaved <laughs> in Egypt, for one, like right. one of the times they were enslaved. <laughs> so not only they're denying that they're the slave that they did have, then by denying the slave that they were, we were never slaves, then they're also denying the fact that God actually lifted them from their slavery yeah. and brought them. So, so not only is the denial of, one, that they were slaves and are slaves, right. and then they are also denying that God actually saved them from their slavery. Because how many times does God say, I am the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt? Yeah. You know, that's how he brings up the Ten Commandments, you know. Right. This is how he opens a discussion on the Ten Commandments. So, uh, so they are, in a sense, by saying we've never been slave to anyone, kind of denying that aspect. It's a startling statement, and it is. It's very human. I mean, we see this, but they are ignoring and the, their history to make this claim that they've never been enslaved. And so, when it comes to then too the 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 when they say now we are not slaves. Mm-hmm. That means that they either, one, don't need to be rescued, right, and two, don't see the need for the hand of God to come and save them. Right. Yeah, they're, 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 they're enslaved to the lie, and they can't even see it. Right. But, but it, all, it all centers in the Word of God, and that is what makes us free. So I think the, that's a good discussion on the text— it is. Uh, next thing I want to do before we get into my top 12 list is we uh, talked about eggs. If you did not listen to that, uh, <laughs> you can listen to it. We had questions on eggs. If you don't want to go back and hear it, I, I can certainly, you can maybe deduce what we talked about suddenly by Hannah answered our question. Oh, she did. Oh, good. Oh, oh by the way, before I forget, okay, um, uh, we did get that song oh yes right and i want to play it when berg's here he's not here but i will need because we did promise a t-shirt yes so uh uh the song maker his name is escaping me it's riley riley uh please email the show with your t-shirt size and which t-shirt you want nice whether it's the 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 standard clerical heirs t-shirt or do you want the uh the The riff the riff on that yeah Right. That's great. Yeah. He, a uh, fellow seminarian, he came through with uh, his version of me singing a song. It's uh, probably a great improvement. All right. So Hannah writes, and, and I appreciate Hannah. She recognizes that I have ADHD, right? Okay. Yeah. So she, she this is how she starts with her, her email. She goes, the short answers to questions are, <laughs> yes, <laughs> pasture-raised eggs are better for you, and no, the cholesterol in eggs doesn't affect the cholesterol in your blood nice. unless you're a hyper-responder. Oh, okay. I didn't know there would be an exception, so that's interesting. So uh, so that, that that's answer for very nice, Hannah. You right. understand the, the host of the show very well. <laughs> right. And then she continues, then, here's the slightly longer Answer, pasture-raised eggs have more nutrients like vitamin A, D, and E, antioxidants, and omega-3 fatty acids compared to eggs from cage or even cage-free hens. Hmm. Uh, And then she has an article for more details. Uh, And then living conditions and diet of pastured eggs, meaning chickens Mm. in pasture, are certainly better for the chickens. Remember, neither a sparrow nor a chicken falls to the ground apart from God. And I believe we ought, as we are able, to choose meat that is humanely raised or hunted, as the case may be, and slaughtered. I will stop there before I climb completely atop my soapbox. <laughs> Secondarily, uh, second, dietary cholesterol, that is, cholesterol we consume from food, does not meaningfully affect the amount of cholesterol in our blood. As one of my favorite dietitians says this, for most healthy people, 
I've always recommended eggs in unlimited numbers and have no plans to stop. With another link if you want to know that. Uh, and then she concludes with, just stop putting yellow mustard on them. No. Gross. Oh, I got to do that sometimes. But, you know, that is a an excellent response. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you for uh, putting a bow on our egg mm. discussion. Nice. All right. So I have a top 12 list, uh, and I will introduce that in just a second, but uh, something needs to happen, Vicar. Peter, play the intro. Enough nonsense. It's time for Bullhagen's Top 12. All right, so um, I've got a top 12 list on, and I've been thinking about this, you know, just, you know, me, I'm always thinking. Oh, yeah. Right? And uh, and, I, and I've talked here and there, I did today, about my ADHD or ADD tendencies, right? Right, yes. I'm sure you've noticed some of those. I have yeah, yeah. times, yeah. Right? Right. And, uh, and so I thought for top 12 list, less theological. But I think helpful because it's my show. We can talk whatever I want to. Yes, that's true. There, but I do think there are. This is some ways that uh, maybe can help Christians and parents and families as well. And 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 simply, uh, I wanted to talk about some things that I have learned in my almost fifty years of life of of ha- of this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um. Because not a, not a lot of people understand it, and people, everybody knows someone. Right. You know? Yeah, and it's become kind of a meme, like, where people claim ADHD uh, at a popular level, which I don't think they've been necessarily diagnosed by a doctor or anything like that. They just, oh, look at me, I'm quirky, I did this one quirky thing, and they attribute it to ADHD or ADD, and they, but just at a pop level. Right. Right. And so, and so I thought, maybe... It might be good for just at least talk about, Vicar, my truth. Oh, your truth. Okay. Uh, because, you know, I've learned a lot of things about it because most of my life I was actually had no diagnosis of it. Okay. And and, uh, and so um, that discovery, oh, probably less than 20 years ago. Right. Uh, really helped me in certain ways that I can learn – uh, how to to think about it, and I want to kind of pass some of that information on. And most of this stuff is 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 me just thinking about it for myself. I'm not I'm not a professional in all of right. this. I'm just saying this is what I have learned that yeah. may be helpful. And there actually is some some honorable mentions here. Oh, so you had more than 12. I had a lot of thoughts on this. <laughs> I had a lot of thoughts actually. That makes sense. Okay. Um, and some of my honorable mentions are the importance of exercise. <laughs> well, we see that. Right. Because uh, it uh, you're always wanting to move or you have trouble sitting still. Mm-hmm. And uh, you notice my fiddle with things a lot and that kind of thing. Well, exercise helps with a lot of that. There's a calming aspect of it. Okay. And it feels good. And the, the second thing is, this is a smaller thing, is, is uh, you'll notice that we tend to interrupt a lot. I tend to interrupt a lot. And the reason why is, is this, um, because when we have a thought that we think is important, I know that if I wait a minute for me to say it, I will forget it. Ah, uh, okay. And so I do things and I say things while it's on the forefront of my brain. Mm-hmm. And you probably notice this in the podcast. I do this all the time oh, too. Yeah. Right? I just pop in with a random thought. Well, I want to get it out there. And I know if I don't, it'll yeah. be gone. So I yeah. have to say things when I... Yeah. So it, it comes across as, oh, I think my idea is important, or it might come across as, uh, you know, I'm, I'm inconsiderate. And I, and I, I, <laughs> I try, I try and, and tame that down because I know that that comes across that way. Right. And I don't want that, that idea to come across. But there are times where it comes across as, oh, I'm interrupting and it's just because I have a thought. I have to get it out. If I don't, I won't remember to do it. I'll, my brain will be onto something else. Yeah. Well, see, with the pastor and a half episodes where it's just 
vicar and pastor that it comes across as, oh, that's my supervisor and he can stop me and say whatever he wants and I have to just take it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and so that, that, that's another thi- thing I want to mention too. And, and, uh, and there's all, all sorts of, you know, interesting things that, that I think come along with it, but uh, I'll, I'll save some of this discussion for the top 12 list. So okay. things I've learned. And so the goal is perhaps you actually notice some of these things in yourself. Hmm, right. Okay. That maybe it might be helpful. Or if you know someone who might have some of these tendencies of how to help them and how to think about them. Right. Right, it's it's kind of like this too. If you're if you have know someone who deals with depression, knowing that and how you deal with that is a lot different than, oh, they must not like me or right. they're whatever the case may be. That that, yeah. that in the same way, uh, knowing and 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 being able to talk and and figure things out and and live life in a way that's very helpful to them, is very, very good. Um, so for example. Uh, that's just not my top 12 list. Like when an ADHD person like me comes across of someone who has depression, ADD is always about constant feedback. Hmm. And because we know we can be impulsive, maybe we interrupt and we know that we're messy. When we come across someone who struggles with depression, uh, we tend to take it personally. Oh, interesting. You know, um, maybe... Because sometimes we think everyone thinks like us. So like when my wife's down, sometimes I'll drive mm-hmm. her crazy because I think the problem, I, I, in my mind, the problem is she hasn't heard enough of my jokes yet. Yes. Yeah. I. <laughs> that makes sense to me, which uh, which is maybe unfortunate because I don't think it turned out to be the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, th- so, uh, so that that's another aspect that I, yeah. you know, as I talk through this, and this might be a long top twelve list. Yeah, there you go. But uh, you know, it's good for me. Yeah. And uh, I've learned a lot about this, and I have a platform. Yeah. Or I can. I, it's not something. That's what I like about the podcast. Add thought here. Yeah. Is is because is the fact that this is all stuff I, I really would never share or talk about in things like Bible class or sermons yeah. or anything like yeah, that. You can't really do it in a sermon. Right. Role. I mean, how would you do? Right. You couldn't. Right. Right. Number 12. Make use of the time when you are most effective. Hmm. Um, and, and along that note, I will say this. Um, pro, uh, procrastination for, for ADHD mm-hmm. isn't always bad. It's bad when you don't get things done. But for an ADHD person, what happens is as the time crunch goes on, you become super productive. Okay. And, and, and procrastination is somewhat, and sometimes is a way where you tap into your, your time of super productivity. Yeah. A life hack. Right. Interesting. Right. And so, um, and, and so there's a lot of, um, as I've learned this, okay, there was a lot of, uh, shame, I would say Mm -hmm. when I was a kid, when I was in college and all sorts of other times where, where I just couldn't get started on something. And, right. and I thought it was just this, this huge moral failing. Mm. And, and you know, what, what's, you know, I can't get these things done. It's because I'm lazy or I don't care. And I knew I cared. I really yeah. wanted to maybe at times study, but I'd, you know, I, in college, I would go to the library uh, cause I have a block set of time to study and I would putz around for an hour and a half before I actually sat down and studied, <laughs> you know? Right. You know, I'd, I'd walk through the library to the table and I'd see a magazine rack. Uh Oh, you know? Yeah. Weird stuff. You know, it, it, it <laughs> kind of like uh, get caught in a Google rabbit hole before Google right. walking through the library. So, so my point is, is make use of the time when you know you are effective. Hmm. And uh, realize that there are times where you're just not going to be effective and you have to be okay with that. Yeah. And so you, you transition from, okay, and this is what I love about being a pastor is it, it is perfect for this because like if I'm, no, I'm not going to be productive in my office, I'll say to myself, you know what? I'm going to go visit someone. Right. And I've seen that. the This is, this is reality that um, you don't sit in your office just because the office hours are uh, in effect. 
if you're not getting something done, you go do something else. And, and I even say, I can tell Vicar. Yeah. I, I'll just be sitting here. So I'm going to go yeah. do something more effective. That's exactly what you say. Yep. I'm going to go do something else because I'm not getting anything done. Right. So, so years ago, I would, see, I, I would carry around a lot of guilt for that type of thing because I should be able to get more done. You know, I'd set a schedule. This is a time where I'm going to do this and I should be able to just sit down and do this. And I couldn't. Right. And I thought, well, and or I'd have a, you know, a, a morning of studying in, in college where, where I would get very little done. I said, mm. what's, you know, I'm lazy. What's wrong? I can't, I didn't get this done. And, and uh, rather than, uh, because I didn't know any of this stuff, yeah. I all, I thought it was that. And uh, I just learned to, over time, to to be effective when I am able to be effective. And uh, if I'm not effective at something at that moment, I switch to something that's helpful that I yeah. can be effective at. Whether it's going on a visit, doing something for my wife, um, yeah, or preparing myself to be more effective later. So if I take a moment to do some exercising, for example, which will help me sit through a meeting better. Right. That's actually something that is helpful in preparation for doing something else. And so it keeps you busy and you, you learn to be very effective and productive. It's just on a different time scale than what other people are on. Got it. Right. I mean, I have a very slight version of that. I don't think I have ADHD, but sometimes when I sit down to do homework I or even even work in my career before this, I would think, okay, well, what do I feel like working on? And so select from my tasks, something that appealed to me more than the other things. Now they might've all been things that didn't appeal to me, but one of them might've been slightly better. So mm-hmm. that's my life hack for maybe a, a person that's, uh, has a different disposition than yourself, but I might, I might look at which task the, the, I, I would, I would say that the kind of the closest thing that I've seen that kind of mirrors it, but it's com- it looks like in a completely different way Okay, is uh, people who might have social anxiety okay. where like they put some like they have to talk to someone or they have to go see someone and they for me it's sitting down and concentrating on something for them it's going out and seeing someone okay but they they feel the same kind of anxiety behind it yeah i hear um, you. so and and there there is an anxiety to adhd that that i've noticed and and that's why you know like if i'm sitting still i always have to play with something like at a pastor's conference right. where i've got these clips that i'm just destroying and right. fiddling with the whole time is because um like boredom isn't just boredom it is like an intense anxiousness okay it's the way i would describe it right like like i remember sitting in class in seminary and uh after about an hour and i'd see that there's a another half hour mm. i would literally inside my head be yelling and screaming and be angry Ooh. like angry that that i that doesn't he understand how, because I, I was, I would take it as if I'm in anguish, I just assumed everyone else was. <laughs> okay. Right? Right. Um, but that, that there was an anxiety behind hmm. those things that people, I don't think people understand. You know, it's kind of funny as I talk about this, you, you know, you mentioned sometimes you, you think you have it, you don't, and there'll be times I'll ask Julie, you know, maybe I don't have this. And she would, <laughs> she laughs at me. <laughs> she can see it. <laughs> right. Number 11. Something that I, I found helpful, and, and this is part of this whole discussion, is is there's nothing wrong with being open about it and not shying away from it, leaning into it. Got it, yeah. Uh, because, uh, you know, when, if I, for example, with you, if I explain this to you, right, I don't use it as a crutch. I don't use it as an excuse. I don't say, no. I'm not going to get these things done because I have it. But I might say, give you a heads up, uh about I might do things a certain way, this is why. Right. Right? Yes. Or um, I'll, I'll be open with our uh, the church secretary mm-hmm. because she knows and she understands that uh, the, other, the other day I was, uh, I needed to leave on the, to, to go somewhere. I, she had some of my communion supplies set up for me for private communion. Right. And, uh, and I, I, it was in her office. I picked it up. And I took it and I set it somewhere really random on a shelf oh, in my no. office. And then she said, where is uh, uh, your communion supplies? Hmm. Well, and I thought there should be on your desk because I had done all of that. 
like picked it up, yeah. wandered around because I had something on my head, yeah. and I set it somewhere without even th- I didn't even realize I had picked it up and set it somewhere. Yeah. Um, without somebody helping you, that would have been a much right. more difficult situation. And because she has seen, she understands that I, I have these things. You because know. you're open about it. Right. Right. That's right. Great. And so rather than, oh, he's careless or mm-hmm. he doesn't care or things that right. people might, if you know, because she sees it and I, you know, and I have things on my mind, I'll sit, let her know. And, right. you know, because yeah. I'm I'm not afraid to shy away from it and I'm a little open about it. Right. It, it helps people understand and they become a lot easier to work with. Right. And even in the confirmation class, you told our young students on, I think I'll say day one of this year's confirmation, they said, you all know me, I'm Captain ADHD. And so these kids obviously already know about that because you're open with them. <laughs> right. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't use that as a, as a, like a crutch or, you know. Right. No, you don't. You know, but, uh. But I, 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 to me, I've learned to be kind of be open, uh, more open about it because it just it helps me work with people a lot, a lot better. And 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 because yeah. and, people, what people do is, is um they read into your actions. Yes. And and so uh, you know, like a, like for example, I mentioned the interrupting thing. Right. And I say now you can read it as this way. From my point of view, I don't mean it that way. Right. And that that opens up a line of communication. Doesn't mean that interrupting is okay, mm-hmm. right? I'm not. That's not what I'm saying. I shouldn't interrupt, and I and I'm, I don't want to uh, take the old Adam out of this because this is all related. Okay. Yeah. Um. Uh. And uh. And and I am a sinner who needs forgiveness, and I don't. I'm not taking that aspect out, but I am working with the limitations that I have. In some ways, but then uh, this will come up later. The next one, actually, um, that uh, I'll just go ahead and, and say it. Number ten. Number ten. I have learned to think of it as a personality rather than a disease. Fallen, yes, but at the same time, it is a personality that comes with a lot of positives. Right. Hmm. Um. So, so if somewhere to sit to like make a snap their fingers and say, if I snap my fingers, you no longer have this. I'd be disappointed Hmm. because to me, it's a package deal. Um, I think I I love it in this way. I think I see the world differently than most. Yeah. Um, and, and everyone seems the world sees the world differently. Uh, and, and you know, when, when Paul talks about the, each one having their own gifts, yeah, I think a lot of this has that aspect of it. So I love that I I see uh, the world in different ways and how I think it makes me a very creative person because my mind works faster in in some ways because it's always moving hmm. and it, I think it helps me. It, my my ADHD mind is one that also comes with a lot of creativity because um, I'm all because I. I get distracted easily. Um, I'm always thinking of what would keep my attention. Hmm. Um, and writing a sermon, I don't want to write a sermon in a way that would make me angry of if I was sitting out in the yeah. pew because right. it's... There's 10 minutes left of this and I can't stand it. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so this this there's a, a drive for novelty that I like, mm-hmm. um, which is why I, I like the vicarage program because I get a new vicar every year. Oh yeah. And, and usually by the end of the year, I'm tired of them. <laughs> okay. Who I hope I get that for. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and I think because the way I, for me view kind of it is if my brain just works at a, a different pace. Yeah. That's where people are still chewing on something. My brain has moved on to something else. Yeah. And you've probably noticed this, like if we're having a conversation and I don't mean anything like you're not interesting or something, there are times where I'm just like, my brain is done. 
Yeah. And I like kind of wander out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now we have a lot of conversations where you've already like halfway gone out my door and then like, and then the next topic springs to mind. So you kind of take a step back in the door <laughs> and then, uh, and you know, actually that's interesting too, because when I think about it, I rarely go to your office because when you have a thought, you've jumped out of your chair and come over to the vicar office. And so we have almost 95% of conversations over on my uh, office door. So I can see actually that in play as your mind. And part of that is too, while you might say, oh, I'll talk to him about this later with me. And if I'm sitting there, yeah. oh, the thought came up, I, I better go while it's on my mind. Right. Go talk to Vicar about it. That's absolutely right. I, I try to think of what would be the best time to go interrupt pastor because I have this thought and I'm thinking about, oh, how, how high of a priority is this thought? And I've got all these things where I'm categorizing my thoughts and, and you wouldn't do that. You would you would have a thought and show up, which is great. Like then we have a conversation. Right. Right. So, so, so with this number 10, I don't necessarily think of it as a a disease. I think of it more as my personality and this is how I'm wired. And I, I do think that, uh, there are many, and I would say that there's probably more pastors who have ADHD than you might realize, Mm. because for me, it's a, it's a perfect job because every day is different. There's such a wide variety of things that I can do, whether it's uh, of sermon work of preparing and reading and learning those things uh, for me it's not sitting down and, and studying something for two hours right it's studying something for about 20 minutes then doing something else and then coming back to it you know right um, and uh, and working on things differently but but uh, to me I, I if someone were to say okay you're not gonna have this anymore to me that that would be that would be I wouldn't like that. No. And I think it also gives me um, a drive to find people interesting. Yeah. Because everyone's so different. Uh, you know, when I come across quirky people, I, I, I like, you probably notice I like almost interview them. <laughs> I kind of find them fascinating. And then when you're in a congregation with where everyone has their own personality, to me, that's fun. Yeah. You know, this person thinks that way. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I. <laughs> right. I am open to the idea that I might have blind spots. <laughs> yeah. That somebody that thinks different than you could be very helpful. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so so there are lots of things. And I think if anybody's like been listening to this podcast this whole time, they you pick up on that. Hmm. You know? That that's why uh, Berg and I work well together because he's the opposite of ADHD. <laughs> Extremely focused on a task for a long yes, period of time. Yes, and he can sit and read a book for four hours right? and study for four hours, where I, I simply can't do that. Yeah. You know, and uh, But that being said, you know, I think there are gifts in how I approach theology, for example, where where uh, I may not always have my nose in a book, but I wrestle with the text in a different way that I think, right. you know, when we talked about the prodigal son. That's what came to mind. <laughs> right. I do think that the way my ADHD mind works actually was part of me thinking about that text right. in a different way. In a disruptive way. <laughs> <laughs> right. So so that is uh, number 10. Um, I, because I've learned to accept it, I'll just put a bow on that. Because I've learned to understand it and accept it, um, I like who I am and uh, not in a like, you know, I'm accepting of sin or anything like that. No, but of course not. Seeing part, parts of it as a personality, um, really, really, uh, I, I like a lot of the things that it comes with. Right on. Number nine. And this is one of the biggest struggles, I, I will say, is you have a strong drive to be organized but you have a unique ability to not be able to carry it out. Okay. Like going into something in a place that is very organized is very calming. Hmm. Okay. It's very calming. Uh, you got a nice clean workspace, fewer distractions, uh, a, a desk piled up with all the stuff has all these different distractions. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, it is very nice and a very good workspace to have a nice, clean, organized place. But the problem is, I can't carry it out. Yeah, it won't stay that way long if it starts out that right. way. Right, and 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 there's another thing time where I, I would view all of that as a moral character flaw. Yeah, but 
Um, it's, it's, I'm wired in a certain way and it's, I don't know. I, I can, I don't see mess because <laughs> I'm, I'm paying attention to something else. Right. So doesn't mean I can't always be, I can always get better. And I know that. And then uh, that's whole not making excuse. Okay. And I, and it doesn't mean I don't try and I should try more. I know all these things. Right. But I can't beat myself up over it because I wouldn't, that would be horrible for me. Well, and I think it's good to, it's, I'll say it's forced me to have a different perspective too, is to say, um, I'll give an example. In the studio, there were a lot of empty beverage containers when I started joining you on the podcast and it concerned me. And so, but I realized, okay, but is that very important? And so if it's not very important. And if I didn't want the empty containers in here, I could take them out of here. And if you look around, I did. And it, that, is, it was not, it was not a big deal. And that's how I had to reset my then, brain. Wait, 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 that is totally an ADHD thing. Totally. Okay. For example, like you could go to my refrigerator and I'll have nine open mustard bottles. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, I got to using where I have a glass, like one glass is different. That reminds me, okay, you have a glass. Otherwise, if I have a cupboard with all where there are 12 glasses and they're all the same, oh. I literally will have eight, by the end of the day, eight glasses out and yes. they'll probably be scattered all around the house. This is something I used to jump on my children's case about. <laughs> yeah. Right. I don't know why. I, I, I can't explain it. But Or having three different shampoo bottles open in the shower. It, all this drives my wife crazy. Oh, I bet. I mean, hearing about it right now is driving me crazy because right. I'm, I'm the other way. Right. It, it, and But, but uh, you know, all these things she's learned with me too. Okay. Where she knows I'm not like trying to annoy her with these right. things. Right. You know? Yeah. And and she understands that it's not because I don't, you know, I, I don't love her that, you know, my carelessness is because I don't love her enough. Okay. Or that I don't consider her, her, uh, what she needs and, and, and all those things that, that and it really has very little to do with that. It would be if I had no effort, mm-hmm. you know. But but all the things that, you know, she loves me, uh, that uh, just like I have, you know, talked about the, the qualities that are I love about having ADHD are the same qualities she loves about me, too. Okay. You know, the fact that every day with me is different, mm-hmm. every conversation, she has a living comedian with her. Right. All the time. She's yeah. never short on jokes. <laughs> I think that's true. <laughs> So, so it's a package deal, you know, the things that she loves about me with a lot of those things, she's learned that it comes with other things. It is a package deal. Yeah. Number eight. And I've touched on this a little, um, earlier, uh, in some ways, but I will, I will say that you, that uh, eight is, uh, be careful because it can take you to a dark place. Hmm. Okay. And uh, and I, I kind of alluded it to to the the fact that it, it, because you a lot of things are a lot more difficult for you, like, like I mentioned studying or procrastinating and right. all those things. Because that is, uh, it can lead you to to really think of yourself in in bad bad terms, not in a healthy way, not like repentance, but but. Uh, um, I think you were saying like worthlessness, like you were lazy. That would explain why you didn't do the things the way you thought right. you ought to do them. Right. I mean, and you get tired of living a mess mm. at times, or I get tired of having a, a messy office. And I, I think, well, I just need more strategies and strategies. Certain things fail and certain things don't work because you always, you always are trying to do things and be a certain way and you don't always get there right um and so uh there is an aspect where that can uh, get you in a dark place but a lot of the other things that i've mentioned are are ways that you can avoid that okay like things that help talking about it being opening about it like we've talked about making sure that people you know and care about understand these things right um embrace the things that uh that are beneficial that God uses 
yeah. f- for others, you know, um, and, uh, um, and, and the other aspect of that is grace, you know, uh, to realize that in this too, you need God's grace and, uh, you, you keep efforting to get better on a lot of these things and you drown the old Adam mm. through the ba- your baptism and all of this daily, daily. And then that goes with, you know, whatever ADHD things that I have. I, and and to that's what helps me keep it from going to a dark place. But it can. Okay. You can get really discouraged when um, uh, you say, let's say I, I'm cleaning out a, a corner of a basement. Mm-hmm. And I spend all my time, like, reading through everything. And I've gotten what should take me 20 minutes takes me four hours. And I'm just consumed in all this stuff right uh that that can be just super overwhelming and and uh and can take you to to some dark places just that Mm. kind of thing um so so all these other things can can help tamp that down for sure um so that uh and so along that note um i have some notes here i should read (laughs) um so, for example, I mentioned like the studying in college where it'd take me a long, long time to get started because I didn't know I really struggled with this. Yeah. I would, I would just go home like feeling really bad. Yeah. Like, like I, I wasted time. Right. Cause, cause I, and, and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a good steward of my time that, at that point. And right. to live a wallow in that can really take you, into a dark place or um uh like in school a lot of times you make careless mistakes Mm -hmm. because you're 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 doing everything so fast to keep up with you so you don't forget things and all those things that spelling like math i was i'm really i was always really good at math concepts okay like i really like calculus and all that stuff i was really good at but I always didn't always get the best grade because I would make a little mistake in the calculations. Yeah, right. It's yeah. So not that I didn't understand it. Mm-hmm. But you just had to keep going to get the full right. thing down. And meanwhile, along the way, something had gone wrong. Yeah. Right. No, I get it. Right. So, uh, um, so along that note, finding things that do work well for you and staying with what works for you, you know, whether it's, I talk about the procrastination thing right. or, or moving on to different tasks, things like listening to music while you work can help, Okay, but it can, but it only works. But like, if you listen like there, if I find a song that works, okay, I will replay that song over and over again. Oh goodness. Like when I'm working out. Yeah. Right. You probably couldn't can't understand this, but a lot of times for the entire fifty minutes I'm working out, I'm listening to the same song over and over. Oh again. my goodness, that that would be uh, not good for for my brain. <laughs> um, and but the, the the point is here is is certain things do work, mm-hmm. but because, um, but when you find something that works, or like music or, or right. something like that, that's going to change because you need novelty. So it's constantly. Oh, okay. You know, so what works might work for the next, you know, for like the next couple of months. And then when you realize, oh, this isn't working, you you switch something up. Okay. Sometimes it means maybe working right away first thing in the morning. Sometimes it means working on the evenings. Sometimes it means it, because it always changes because you're always needing something mm-hmm. novel. And so don't beat yourself up over that. Just find something that works. Okay. No, that's very interesting. I feel like I am also opposite of that in some ways because I might find something that works for me and uh, and then never want it to change ever again. Not, oh, now it's working, I got to try something else. But like, okay, I go to a restaurant, I order something and I like it. I'll probably order that every time I go to that restaurant for the rest of time. <laughs> Do you know how I also see that between the difference between you and me? What? Is like, I will literally like get bored of my clothing. I will change my clothes like four times in a day. Oh, I don't do that. <laughs> I mean, you see what I'm wearing. It probably looks a I'll, lot like my wife will yesterday. see me changing it. Well, what was that? What was, why did you change? <laughs> I just wasn't feeling that shirt right now. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I might have to yank your man card because I'm not sure about that. That sounds, that doesn't sound like what a man does to me. All right. You got to take it from me. <laughs> oh yeah. That's right. My supervisor. I mean, that sounds like a great idea. We should all be changing our clothes all the time. <laughs> Yeah, but no, I, seriously, I, I interesting. like, so when we do laundry, I usually have probably twice as much laundry at least than my wife. Oh man. Yeah. That's not how it is at my house. And, and I, I, and you know, I don't, I can't explain it, No, but I, I find certain clothes to be more helpful. I probably sound Looney Tunes at this point, yeah, but, but you know what? Like, again, I go back to, is that very important? And no, it's not something to get hung up on one way or the other. It's not very important. It's just quirk. Yeah, just because you you might not understand why I do it. Right. You know, just like I wouldn't understand wearing the same kind of clothes all the time. Yeah. Yeah, that would drive you crazy. Why should you do that? You shouldn't do that. (laughs) You know why this is really helpful to me, though, is because, like, you you were steps removed from me. And I'll explain what I mean in a moment. Uh, And so I have all this, I will call it grace with you. Like, oh, you want to do things that way? Great. And where I trip up and have a blind spot is when somebody's close to me, and in this case, my wife. If she's doing things that I don't understand, it gets to where, well, I expect her to do things more the way I would want to do them in my head. And this is helpful to talk to you to where I see, well, nobody has to do things the way I do. Why why should my wife have to do things exactly the way my head is? I mean, I have grace with you. Why not the wife that I love? Right. Yeah. So it's very helpful for me to hear this. Number seven. Be in tuned to when you are impulsive and when that might be a problem. Hmm. So like the interrupting thing, that's part of that is also an impulsive nature. Got it. And, and, uh, that, that can lead you to some bad things. Okay. Like to do things without thinking. So part of that is like, um, I'm actually, you probably notice very measured when I talk Yeah. at times, Yeah. especially if it's an important situation. Yes, I have seen that for sure. And um, I'm perfectly fine sitting and listening and not overreacting. It's because um, I've learned because of my impulsivity to do things like mm-hmm. is uh, is I'm very in tune to, especially in certain situations, not being that way and the importance of listening okay. and not saying things or doing things in a quick manner that my brain is telling me to do that can lead me into either conflict or misunderstanding or sinful situations where, you know, part of temptation is being impulsive Okay, and kind of saying, okay, I'm not be mindful of, of those. Yeah. I have a question about that. Did it take you a while to train into being the good listener? I've seen you be a good listener in important situations, which seems opposite of who you are at other times, and yet I know you can do it. Did that take a while to get to that point? Um, yeah, perhaps. Okay. Uh, I think some of it is is I, I, I tune into the other aspects because, um, I find the 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 problem solving interesting. I found find, you know, I have trouble listening when it's mundane. Okay. So like. A city council meeting that dragged on 40 minutes longer than right. all that. Okay. Right. But if it's like, say, for example, we're talking about a sermon and we're trying to solve a problem, okay. a sermon, I am super in tune to that, right? Right. And my ideas come, boom, 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 yeah. boom, right? Yeah, they do. <laughs> it probably drives you crazy. Like, oh, it's okay. Though. Like, <laughs> it will, you know, we're say, well, how do we do this? And I'm like, I have like 10 ideas just blurred out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. But then you, you hopefully then at the end of that have told me like, these are just all ideas. Use the one that works and you don't have to use everything I just said. Just use the one that works, right. <laughs> which right. is, was very helpful. But I'm also thinking about when we go on visitation and you're, um, you know, I guess I'll praise my supervisor right out loud at the extreme risk of being a brown noser, but you're very good at ta- talking to a person who's maybe a shut in, for example, and listening to what they say with full attention and patience and time and let them say their mind. And I feel like that's a skill. And I see that and I think I need to learn to do that because what happens with perhaps with me is like, oh, I've got an idea of how I can, you know, what I need to say here. And instead of being silent, it would be a very tempting for me to jump in and solve. And I'm wiggling my fingers with quotey marks, solve their problem with the first thing that springs to mind. And I see that you don't do that. Yeah. I think part of that is, is, um, well, one, uh, you know, 
these are people I care obviously deeply about. And right. so, um, and I see the information I'm getting is so valuable. Okay. That, yeah. um, um, that helps me in my sermon writing. Mm-hmm. It helps me in all sorts of things. And, and, and I want to be as helpful as I can to them. Um, and I do think that, um, uh, there is a, and at least in me, I think, in my ADHD thing, uh, and maybe it's just me, of uh, perceiving people well. Okay. And and uh, kind of get trying to get at the heart of an issue and try to really understand that. So, so it, it, in a way, there's a hyper-focus because I find it interesting and I find the people uh, that I care for to be very interesting and, um, and uh, which is why I, I think playing to your strengths, yeah. which is why I wanted part of, I liked being a pastor is to, to do that because from, for, for mo- most people, that kind of thing is exhausting. Yes, it can be. Right. If and it's different than like me sitting with, like, a, like in a class setting, mm-hmm. where I'm just getting information and and some most a lot of times it's not helpful. Um, whereas this is, um, in in the it's one on one, it's uh, helpful information, it's unique, it's novel, yeah. And, um, and so, uh, and because, because, you know, I, I see the failings in other areas, um, I kind of latch on to that aspect of it because it, it, that helps me, you know, when you're, you're listening and you're good listening and you're a good communicator and you're a good help to people in times of need, um, uh, that gives you a lot of currency to, to help you realize, for example, if I'm interrupting or things that make me look like I don't care or careless, mm-hmm. uh, it sees, well, that's obviously not him. Does that make sense? I guess that last part didn't make sense to me. Okay. What do you mean by obviously not him? Well, I meaning that if some things that I do make me seem careless. Okay. Oh, okay. Right? The fact that other yes. times where I'm really concerned and, and care and, I, and, I, and that's expressed and, and obvious... When times when I'm careless, it helps them to see, well, I get it now. It's not that he doesn't care. Right. We know from his whole uh, person that he cares. Right. And this other thing is a quirk. Number six. And I, we've talked about this a lot already. So I'll, I'll kind of go through this one quickly. It's about your loved ones. Uh, lack of thoughtfulness is not a lack of love. Mm. There is a desire. There is a desire not to leave those seven bottles of mustard open, <laughs> right? Right in the fridge. Oh goodness! Um, but uh, for the loved ones, a lot of things that you you love, like the the, the, the passion that they that I have for life, or people with ADHD often have, mm-hmm. um, and uh, don't take all those things personally. Um, but uh, help them find solutions to whatever issue you might be having with your loved ones, not in a blame way, but mm. in a solution-based way. Okay. Because we'll take that blame to heart because we feel the same thing. Mm. Like, like if it's just a brought up is as a moral issue of why I have seven mustard jars. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, that's a great example because it keeps driving me nuts every time you say it. And right. I picture seven open jars of mustard. Or- <laughs> and if you were to talk to me, I would say. I know that's ridiculous. Okay. That, I know that's stupid. Okay. Well, that's a, well, that's a good thing to point out because it's not like you think that's the superior way. And so therefore I need to, con- if it was say me and you, for whatever reason, we're roommates. Right. That I would need to somehow convince you, well, no, you're wrong. That's not the superior way to do things. Well, you don't think it's the best way to do things. Right. So you find solutions to these problems without like saying you don't care or this yeah, or that okay. yeah. and, and, and making it uh, feeding into the the same kind of things that, I would naturally feel because I, I, I recognize hmm. those things too. You know, I recognize when I have trouble getting started to work, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I carry enough weight around knowing that as well. You don't necessarily have to add to the blame in okay. that situation, but rather realizing 
those things. Let's work on a solution. I'm curious if the other six jars of mustard should be hidden from you or if that wouldn't work because you'd just go to the store and buy another one without realizing. I'm just curious. <laughs> Do you th- I actually, I think I know p- as I think about what part of the issue is. Okay. Okay. Like, like there's a lot of patience involved with getting the last bit of mustard out. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair yeah and i and i have that kind of patience when it comes to emptying a container right. all the way i literally and i mentioned this actually before in the podcast i literally when pumping gas mm-hmm. have stopped before i've gotten to a full tank because it's taking too long <laughs> and i can't stand it <laughs> oh yeah yeah me and you are very different people right but that's I've, I've, like the number of times i feel gas it's i'll go i'll, I'll make it to about three quarters of a tank. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, so the prices are so high on the fuel right now, and I get diesel fuel for my pickup truck, and there are limits on the credit card, and it's a 30 gallon tank. So that's the background. So the last two times I have filled it up, the credit card hit the dollar limit allowed at a pump before it could fill the truck all the way up. And the fact that I'm telling you this right now lets you know that that stuck in my brain as an inadequate way life should be, that I could not fill up my 30-gallon <laughs> tank all the way because the credit card hit $125 at one of the pumps and $100 at a different one that had a lower limit. And I couldn't fill it up all the way, and it's driving me nuts right now. <laughs> number five. All right. That brings us to number five. And I want to talk about uh, maybe the aspect of when I think of, of children okay. who might have some of this stuff. Okay. Uh, and particularly my own self as a child, because I'm just kind of going by personal experience. Because I think my children have maybe have had a little bit of this. Okay. Um, but I think they would all say that that um, not like I do. Okay. Because like Peter, he would when he was uh, uh, like six, he was reading chapter books in his bed. Right. And and that just blew me away. <laughs> That is mind blowing because so. uh, because uh, even when I was older, like say I was in eighth grade and I had to read a, a, like a chapter book and do a book report. Right. This is how it would go. I would read the first two pages, and I would say, "Okay, this is this pa- book has 180 pages." I read those two pages in about a minute a page, so I should be able to get this book done in about four hours. And then I would read another page. I'd see how long that would take, <laughs> and rather just reading it. Right. Like I was doing math, trying to get it over with, and then I would I would do that. And I said, okay, I read these tw- 20 pages. I got that done in a half an hour. I should be good. But then if you were asking me, what did you read? Uh, oh, no. Right. It was, yeah. it was so painful that I was like, look, it was just like, how do I get this done? Ah, uh, right. Meta reading, <laughs> like above the text, I guess. Oh, right. Interesting. So, so and uh, this goes right along with, with children, okay, okay. How, to, how to help them with them. One is, is to teach them to write while they read. You, t- you read a paragraph. If you're having trouble understanding it, this is what, how it got. I have uh, a, a stack of all my readings from seminary, uh, notebooks about that high okay. of reading a paragraph, writing a sentence about what that paragraph said. Reading a paragraph, mm-hmm. writing a sentence. And then what, I, what, it, what it did is it forced me to, to concentrate on each paragraph, making sure I understood what it said before I moved on. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good system for sure. I mean, otherwise I would have just, you know, read five pages and it would be, I'd find it, even if I understood, I'd find it interesting for a brief second and I would understand it in that brief second, then it'd be gone. Like you've noticed even like hymns, like okay. I will find a particular part of a verse while I'm singing next to you kind of interesting and I will stop, start thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I would lose my, I lose my place singing hymns. Have you ever yeah. noticed that before? I've noticed, but I, I, I think that's such a common thing for okay. all people. But um, for me, I guess another version of that that happens to me is actually listening to a sermon. And a well-written sermon is going to remind me of my own life. That's part of what it's a sermon should be. But suddenly I'll realize that I have started pondering my life and my mind has gone off like into the distance and I haven't heard the last three sentences or whatever the number from, from the sermon. I need to bring my mind back and hear what the sermon, the rest of the sermon is going to say. So, so going back to the children aspect of it. Right. Okay. Remember I talked about how, how part of ADHD is you want, you desire to be organized, but you can't do it. Yeah. 
right? That's something a parent can help with. I, I want to hear they about can, this. They can help a child have some structure in what they're doing um, so that it's a comfortable place for them. Because I think a lot of times it gets to these, well, you need to be more, you need to have a clean room, you need to have a right. clean space. And uh, rather than say, go clean your room or do this, sometimes it's okay to like sit in there, okay, let's do this next. Let's do something interesting while we clean your room. Yeah. Um, when it comes to homework, let's find ways. I When you're doing math equations that are repetitive over and over again, let's find a way to make it interesting. Hmm. So that you can make it kind of novel, and so it's not just here do this when you're dealing with a child, right? The other thing I would say too is is uh, for a parent to be less concerned about grades and more concerned about what they know and understand, because grades will be a little bit lower at times just because of carelessness. Okay, just because overlook like math, like I mentioned before. Uh, I understood all the concepts, but I might get a C on a, a particular test because I just made some, I put the one in the wrong line. Right. Right. And so, so that's another aspect. Um, uh, and all the things that I've mentioned up to this point about maybe helping them be able to communicate, uh, teaching them this, these kinds of coping skills that I've, I've learned for myself. Right. Um, uh, don't feed into the blame aspect of it where they just feel off all the time for mm. things that they do care about but have trouble carrying out. Got it. And and I will say this too. I mentioned reading. Also writing like um, is a chore too. But, but I, I would say I went from hating writing um, and h- hating the idea of writing a paper but at the same time, I've loved communicating. Hmm, okay. Um, why? Well, communicating is fast pace. You're getting constant feedback. You, um, hmm. you're, uh, you can blurt things out. You know, you can do all sorts of things. Writing is so measured and so organized. Now, with my sermons, I handwrite them because one of the reasons I think probably is because I can keeps your hands busy for maybe that's part of it right um and uh and, and it becomes less of a task i don't know i don't i can't explain it well it um, seems also it allows you some free form with your creativity so when you're writing something and you have an idea that's better illustrated than it is written into word form or or i don't know you want to arrange the words above each other or to the side and one whatever like you can't really do right that. Maybe, maybe i learned from early on you know how i like i have an idea and i want to blurt it out oh yeah I think because I started out, you know, everyone starts out slower at typing. Yeah. That I'd rather handwrite it okay. or, or write it like a word and then like scribble it out and then try and get it. My brain was able to work with my hand writing faster than it could type. Maybe that's yeah. it too. Yeah. But, and part of it is too, like for me, if I open up the computer to write a paper, <laughs> Here comes notifications and distractions. Right, right, right. I wonder who won the game, and I wonder, right. you know. I mean, I guess to a degree, I guess for me, I, I kind of like that because when I I'm doing part of my work and I run into something that hits me as like this one, this element of the work is a true chore that's going to take concentration and time, and I'm not ready for it yet. Then I automatically switch tasks for a moment to uh, get comfortable with the idea that right. I have to do the hard thing next. Right. So, so, but I, but I, so that being said, like there was a definite switch where writing and, and having the creative output switched where as I grew, I did learn the ability to, to, um, to sit down and write, but the creative side of it made it more interesting. Hmm. Right on. So, and then also I would say to parents, uh, uh, to, because I, I mentioned I don't really view it as a disease of personality. Right. You know, to, to really allow them to use their creative mind and their interesting way of thinking as a blessing, you know, to find things, whether it's active or creative or 
or something that really helps them, that they can find something that excel and that uses those gifts that they they probably do have. Right. Yeah, that's good advice. So, so in some ways, we do have to conform to the way we, everyone has to conform with everyone else. But at the same time, don't force them to con- to be something that they're not right. with some of those things. Right. We should take advantage of the fact that we live in the United States of America in the 21st century. And to a degree, we have a huge amount of freedom to be who we are and who we ought to be and all that. And so why force people into a mold? All right. Uh, we're getting kind of long, so we need to get these top 12 through. Okay. Or else Peter will be mad. He'll be mad, yeah. And if people with ADHD will be mad that we're taking so right. long. Right. They long ago started screaming inside their brain. <laughs> Why? <laughs> All right. Number four. Number four. Be careful with nicotine and alcohol. Oh, okay. Very specific now. Very specific. Um, like, I really I really enjoy cigars, right? Okay. Yep. Um, When you have ADHD, like nicotine is amazing okay that's so i only have a cigar like once a month right on right because it, it would it'd be very it'd be unhealthy like if i did it often yeah it would be very addictive for me because nicotine just calms you down and hmm. now i'm sure that does to everybody but there is something about it that for like when you have hd that it's like a super medicine interesting i've never heard that and like if like if I have a cigar, like I can just sit and talk and be relaxed and mm-hmm. and uh it it just tamps everything down and it clears your mind. Like when you have ADHD, nicotine is amazing. Okay. Seriously. <laughs> so you gotta be super careful. I do think I <laughs> I would say that people who are like hardcore smokers, mm-hmm. uh for example, like if you like a lot of comedians, part of their act is having a cigarette. Right. I, I think there's a connection between comedians being creative, fast right. minds, yeah. outgoing, all those things that come with it, and then the nicotine medicating them. Right. I mean, you can just picture in your head the comedian on the stage, and he's holding, like, whiskey and a cigarette in the same hand while he's doing his routine and kind of waving his hand around. And every now and then he takes a drag off the cigarette, and every now right. and then he takes a sip of the whiskey. Right. And it's part think, of the deal. I think part of like. I think part of it is for nicotine, it's a stimulant mm-hmm. that that stimulants actually are calming for ADHD. That's what, that's weird. <laughs> okay, and I think nicotine has that, and then alcohol obviously just slows everything down. Okay, and that that and so for example, like that anxiousness of of sitting still for a long time, like mm-hmm. that, that that I said, it's a real anxiousness if I if I had to sit like an extra fifteen minutes in a class. Yeah, you know, like I would rather be spanked than time out. Oh yeah, as a as a kid. Yeah, as a kid when they used uh, to spank get it kids. over with. Okay, let's, <laughs> uh, you know. Well, I don't know. I think that's okay. Probably a whole other topic. I want a whole other topic. Yes, but uh, but so so like if you have ADHD, and this might be something with kids, uh, that uh, to to be aware. But like nicotine and alcohol, you got to be careful with because they are effective coping medications, especially nicotine. I'm not, I'm not as, like I said, I have a cigar once a month and I right. limit it to that because, because, uh, yeah, it's wisdom. Like you see a, a pitfall there and you've avoided it by giving yourself, uh, a restriction. Um, and alcohol is the same way where, uh, like it, there's a calming aspect because if your mind, you're having trouble sleeping because your mind's always going, Yeah. you know? Um, oh Yeah. So don't take Benadryl to go to sleep either, I suppose, <laughs> because it works too well. I mean, that might be for people not with ADHD, but I right, don't know. right. But I would say particularly those two are. I think I think a lot of people who might struggle with smoking and alcohol. Mm-hmm. I think some of that, in some instances, might be ADHD related. Just yeah. going by how those things feel to me, okay. and that, that I have to be careful with whether it's smoking or drinking. You know, uh, of the, of those things can have a so you just got to be aware of it. Okay, very good. You're learning something. I am. I would never have had that. And I wonder the way your mind works, which is fascinating. It might be that people haven't made that connection. I mean, do you recall reading that information anywhere that there was a connection, or have you just observed it in yourself? Just obs- that's strict observation. Yeah. That's strict. 
And it might have taken somebody like you to realize the connection because the, I'll say the rest of us, meaning people that don't apparently have ADHD, would never have known that. Like, I never understood smoking. Like, I yeah. remember thinking, oh, yeah, it's dude, why would anybody start smoking? It's yeah, so, so unhealthy, right? Right. Right. Then I had a cigar. I'm like, <laughs> like that first drag of a cigar, I'm like, really interesting. Oh, <laughs> seriously. As there, yeah. there's, there is. Right. Well, I mean, and there are certain things in life that I've avoided because I don't want to like them and get into an expensive hobby, and I'm pretty sure I would like it. Um, smoking never really was one of those too much, though. I never thought, oh, I'm very tempted by this. I, I wasn't. So right. There it is. Yeah, but like, if they ever find a way to like standardize nicotine so it's you know not unhealthy and and find whatever it is that yeah it would be it would I guarantee it would be an ADHD super drug. So how about nicotine gum? Maybe I actually. <laughs> have you tried that? <laughs> I actually, I'll, truth be told, I have, I have a little thing of nicotine gum in my desk. Okay. For times I need to super focus. Got it. And I just have a little piece. Yeah, that makes sense. I have like a little. I have nicotine gum that's lasted me probably for two years. Okay. So that gives you an idea. Okay, but I kind of want to look under your desk and see if you're sticking your gum to the bottom of your desk, though. <laughs> but that that too, I. Like, I wouldn't do that, like, uh, within two weeks. Like, if I had a piece of oh, the I gum, see. I wouldn't. You'd put do, it I would not least, do it. Then right. I, I would not have any more until f- I'd wait two weeks before I had it again because I don't. Right. You're being careful and you don't want to get addicted to it. Right. Got it. Number three. And maybe this is just, I don't know if this is me or ADHD, but usually, like, with you have trouble doing the hardest tasks. Okay. The things that take the most concentration are the hardest to begin. And so if you can pick the one hardest thing that you have and just get it done first. Right. It's it's it I I kind of think of it it's almost like if I describe it like an elephant in the room type of a thing. Yeah. Address that elephant first. Like put all your effort into that as much as you can because then you do feel better about the rest of your day because you got that out. Right. Because some, what happens is because it's so hard to task it like and you have trouble starting it becomes like something that that uh you avoid doing and you avoid doing it and it, it, it you, then it, te- it keeps you from doing all your other stuff it's like i don't know how to explain it but yeah. but uh um with certain tasks um especially small break them up into small tasks and think about the task at hand first that's with everything but but if there's one really hard task that takes super concentration, just try to get that one task done first. I've seen that go both ways because there are times where I have a pretty decent sized to-do list like we all do, and they're one of the things I really don't want to do. And so the silver lining on me postponing the thing I don't want to do is I do absolutely everything else. Um, so my to-do list gets accomplished, and then finally I still have to do the thing that I had to do, the, the harder right. thing. So I've seen it go both ways, but I generally agree with you that it's better. Like you've probably heard the saying, if you have to eat a frog, do it right away right. in the morning. And the other <laughs> the other aspect of, the, of that is is uh, to small rewarding of your own behavior. Hmm. You know, like if I can get this done, then I'll, you know, go work out. Or, oh, okay, yeah. You know things like that, where where you have in mind the things that that uh, does really motivate you to that you, you use that as a motivation to kind of keep yourself to do that those things. Right. No, that's a good hack too. I like that one. Number two, uh, know your distractions. Okay. And avoid them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Not just know them and indulge in them. <laughs> right. Just be aware. Like okay. If I'm going to do this, uh, um, then f- maybe that's why I handwrite everything. Because if mm-hmm. I get on the computer, I'll be distracted by something. Right. So I'll just handwrite it, limiting distractions. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, a simple one. But just being sure. aware of that. So that if you fall into one of those distractions, uh, you might... By having known beforehand that was a potential pitfall, you you recognize it for what it is, and you can make the decision to pull out of that distraction and go back to what you were supposed to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then the last one. And number one. Live by grace. Ah, 
a very good one. I don't see that one written down as I look across the table. Is it down there? Oh, you just didn't put a number by it. So that's why my confusion. You know, that, and uh, because that's what what we need. We, we talked about in the sermon, ultimately, uh, the paralyzed man. Yeah. Right? What was his greatest need? He needed his sins forgiven. And that that with this and every situation, that yeah, that is that is the same. So you live by grace. Uh, you drown the old Adam, right? And uh, uh, you you seek seek improvement. Yeah, in that grace. Fantastic, because there's true freedom in the grace. True, correct. Full circle. <laughs> yeah, full circle. So probably maybe not the average, but I I, th- I hopefully everyone else found it interesting. I think they will. And uh, if anybody has any other things they'd like to add. Yeah. If there's anybody uh, who who this, because I think what happens is as I go through this list, like someone's going to be laughing really hard about something that yeah. they do. They're like, oh, <laughs> uh oh, or, or someone, uh, something a loved one does like, oh, right. yeah, I, I didn't have that moment, uh, but it was interesting to me. And I got to bring it up one last time. I'm still going crazy about the seven containers of mustard being right. open at the same time. So maybe I've got some other issue. OCD, going. maybe. Maybe that, I wonder. <laughs> OCD and, and ADD, so close, but so yeah. far. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm going to go look in your refrigerator and count the jars or the containers of mustard. <laughs> All right. Uh, where can they get a hold of us, Vicar? Ah, we can be reached by email, feedback at clericalerrors.org. On Facebook, we're found at Clerical Errors Podcast. P for podcast. That's next. Twitter <laughs> at Clerical Errors P. P for podcast. There it is. Uh, that's how you can reach us. All right. Well, thank you for listening. I'm Bull Hagen. This is Vicar. And may your mustard jars be, be- unopened. <laughs> thank you for joining us. This podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Questions, thoughts, concerns? You can contact us on Facebook at facebook.com slash podcast, on Twitter at clericalheirsp for podcast, or email us at feedback at clericalheirs.org. Thanks for listening to Clerical Heirs. See you next time.